why, why remain indifferent? Why, why not uh, you know, fundamentally change? Is it because people really want freedom from freedom? Is it because they're scared to death of what it means to walk the Siddhartha road? Is it because they don't really want truth, justice and freedom? Now that's a very hard question and controversial one to ask, but everyone here should be asking it. Yeah, well, this is a event put on by Karen Sawyer, who um, very kindly uh, featured me in her book, you know, Dangerous Man, uh, The Dangerous Man, and that was a privilege, and uh, felt like reciprocating to come to her, f uh, I think this is her second event, or as she's put on a conference in the beautiful city of Bath. And uh, I didn't do a talk per se, but you know, I did the introduction. And it's just a great opportunity to meet you know, my heroes like Ralph Ellis and you know, scholars of that caliber and to just uh, be in England, basically, because this is actually the second time that uh, I've appeared in public you know, in England. So that was, uh, and that's after many years. So that's always interesting, you know. And I couldn't resist seeing this part of the world, you know, because it's so historical. It's, so, it's got so much ancient history. You know, and the lineup was very good, because actually I am very particular about who I will work with or say yes to when it comes to conferences and radio shows and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Karen's just a very wonderful person, really believes in what I'm doing and gives you the freedom to, you know, do your more current work. So it was a great opportunity, you know. Well, we're always working on several things. The last major project was Architects of Control. It's part of a series. It was a DVD that uh, is basically a first of its kind, fusing, a fusing conspiratorial, you know, uh, content information, which, you know, after 9-11 now, the, you know, the world realizes something seriously wrong here, and there's been a big phase shift. But I've been doing this work for many, many years, and uh, my particular approach is to fuse that same kind of material with a kind of a psychological, possibly even philosophical uh, bent, you know, with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the desire to point out to people that the kind of dysfunction that they see in the world, the state of decay, is not really about an active, uh, um, in-your-face tyranny, which is what people in the early stages believe. You know? And believe me, that is going on. But I look at the foundations of all of these things, the roots of tyranny, whether it's of this age or of many thousands of years, you see, you know, with my work on history. And so the psychological aspect comes in when you just try to point out to people in a certain way that, look, you know, there's something that you may be doing in your individual life, in your relationship with yourself, that um, brings about ty tyrannical act action, you know, and uh, we've been doing work on that. Architects of Control was one look at that and uh, various other works I've done on this sort of 2012 concept, certainly follow-ups to Architects of Control that I'm making will sort of, you know, elaborate more deeply on that. And it's been really, I'm amazed, it's really been well greeted, people really digging this, you know, because I thought, oh God, this is going to be a little bit abstract for people, you know. But actually time has elapsed and people are really up to speed. People have been researching themselves so fast at such a fast pace. And then with the advent of YouTube and, you know, MySpace and all that, there's so much information on the net going around that I always look at that as a very positive thing. And then, therefore, when I put this stuff out, well, a few years ago, you know, it would have been completely abstract. People would have even completely had a problem with that you even fuse together, you know, conspiracy with psychology. You know, it would have been difficult for them to see where the connections are. But now, you know, people are responsive to it, which it makes my job all the easier, you know. So it's been a very good response. Many reasons for that. One is psychology. One is uh, what David Icke calls the totalitarian tiptoe. Um, and Ralph Ellis refers to it as the salami, you know, salami uh, slicing effect, which is a gradual drip feeding of uh, tyranny. Tyranny, as I said, is not in your face. It's not necessarily a jackboot type of control. It's a very uh, surreptitious form of control done over many, many years and decades. To do what? To get people into hive mentality and groupthink, and also to basically, fundamentally, this is how the psychology ties in in my work, is to erode a man's sense of selfhood uh, that, that people from the religious world would call the soul. Well, you know, but uh, that's kind of a loaded term, so I prefer to use the term self. But basically the spirit of man, the man's sense of independence, is slowly collectivized. Um, 
in the way that many of the people I refer to of the past, scholars, teachers, filmmakers, have always demonstrated and shown. This has been brought up in fantastic series and movies and still is being shown in some very interesting films that are being shown. And certainly in the work of Aldous Huxley and so many other thinkers who've talked about this particular process. Some speak about it in detail, others speak about it in more general terms. And I want to speak about it specifically. I like to look into the exact roots of why this is happening. Uh, and the slow erosion of, a, of people's selfhood not only makes them collectivized, but it forces them into hive think, which makes them deeply dependent on the approval of other people around them, and ultimately on the approval of bosses, you see, in the state and the establishment, the politicians, the priests. In other words, the famous authority figures that we all know about. The more you become dependent on these people, and now we're even becoming dependent on, on what I would describe as technocrats, you know, the builders of the scientific purgatory, the global village. Not that I'm bashing science or te technicalness, that's all excellent. I mean, you couldn't have cameras and TV and all of that without it. I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking about the ideology by which technology and technical things and science is being used in the same process that religion used to do for thousands of years, which is to erode a man's sense of selfhood, to make him think of himself as a sinner, you see, to make him conform to one set of commandments, to envision one kind of heaven for all kinds of people, to repress his natural, in natural instincts, to have an antipathy towards the natural world and towards women and animals and so on. Technology has picked up the, uh, the trowel, you know, it's like the, the religious people get exhausted building the wall, they're taking a break, and the scientist comes in and picks up the cement and the trowel and goes, oh, we'll, we'll finish it off, you know, and they're now continuing to build the wall uh, of, of the global village. So there's that to take in, in mind, because this creature that is their product now is only a half self or a third of a self, a very existentially inauthentic person. And also, he now becomes dependent on their approval and their money and, the, and, and everything about his life. He's looking to these authority figures. And therefore, he has lost so much of his own inner guidance and his own inner understanding that now he has abnegated his own willpower to the leader, to the expert, to the elder. And therefore, they are able to guide man very easily. In the past, we saw this. It's one of the reasons why life in history has taken on the shape that it has done. Uh, with the division of continents and all sorts of other fa faculties. You see the class system, for instance, is one aspect of this control mechanism. You know, There's many others, the educational systems. This was to soften up our forefathers, a pit one group against the other, all of these different kinds of things, arms race, like between communism and the West. You know, There's many permutations of this, uh, East versus West, uh, affluent societies versus you know, the, the primitive societies. All that, there's so many aspects of this. That was to get our forefathers you know, into that mode where they would become inhabitants of this social hive and slowly erode their identity. Now we're seeing it in a different way. So the architecture of control that exists is entirely based on, rooted in man's own escapism or avoidance of the call of selfhood. And you can't address that matter in a purely conspiratorial alternative research community, inevitably it's, you have to enter into the psychological world. And I'm one of the first people to do that in this particular way. It has been touched on by others, of course, but you know, nobody's really done it to the full extent and with the breadth and scope you know, of the work that we've been doing currently. No, I'm against it. Uh, first of all, one has to understand that when they look to the East, it might look all bloody exotic. It might look all exotic you know, from our perspective of the West, because again, we've been so raped of some of our cultural and traditional roots that the Eastern mysticisms and Eastern yogas and Eastern teachings and religions might look very exotic as they do to most people who are living in New York City and feeling very cut off. And there's always been these cults of the hippies and other new age now, you have all this stuff where they're looking to the East as if it's some sort of a, you know, solve all. I don't think that way at all. Um, I'm very much a student of the Western magical tradition. So I'm saying, yes, there are magical traditions, there are mystical traditions, but you, know, you don't really need to go to the East necessarily. But more importantly than that, is we have to fundamentally understand that the kind of Brahmanism, Hinduism, even Sikhism, and certainly the Islamism um, that we are finding in these Oriental countries is a Christianity of another kind. It's not, it's not any better, it's very patriarchal. It's very uh, antithetical to nature, you see. So I don't believe there's that many answers there. In fact, in, one might say it's even a bit of a distraction. And you brought up the point very well that, in fact, one of its primal uh, doctrines is the you know, abnegation of the ego. 
Now, which is of course very, very wrong, it's very misgiven. However, we, we, we might give a bit of slack by saying that there's a problem here with the semantics you know, of, of their definition of what ego is. It's not precisely the same as what the Western uh, concept is. So, you know, one would have to spend a lot of time getting into that because it, it is actually fundamental. The Eastern concept of collectivism uh, um, always has stood it in opposition to the Western man's feeling of independence. This is on the surface anyway. You know, uh, on paper, you, you, you'd feel that. And if you look at the monkhoods and the priesthoods and the way people live in the East, the self doesn't play a very big role. It's there, but it's the, it's the group, it's the tribe, it's the cult, the religion that takes precedence. And I've always had problems with that, you know, both in my personal life and in other studies.